And hello, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baghurst, and today's special guest is Mike McGurn. He is at Queen's University in Belfast. He's the head strength and conditioning coach. It's an unusual title for a university in the United Kingdom, Mike. So tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today and, and what your job is now. Okay. Uh, okay. I uh, grew up in a small town in, in Northern Ireland called Enniskillen. And like a lot of kids at that age, we, we played every sport going football, as you guys call it, soccer, Gaelic football, which is an Irish version, hurling. You know, we did cross country running, athletics, basketball, we did it all. But I had a real fascination about uh, how the body worked. And I got involved in long distance running, cross country, and track. Wasn't that talented, but just had a very, very high workload. And through my athletics career, I ended up being offered a, a four-year scholarship uh, for track and cross country to Temple University in Philadelphia. And I studied uh, physical education there. And that's when I really got the, uh, the interest for doing strength and conditioning. At the time, John Cheney, the great uh, John Cheney, was the basketball coach who only passed away two weeks ago. Uh, he was a big influence in, on how he conducted his practices. He had a great philosophy in bringing his athletes in early, get the training done when they're fresh. Then he used to bring them for coffee and a donut and then let them go to class. So that's where I got to experience John Cheney. And uh, then I also then got really interested in watching how the American football team practiced, what they did on the pitch, but also what they did in the gym. And because it was such, such a diversity of sports at Temple, and we took a lot of them for our credits for, for our course that we got to experience Greco wrestling, which I hadn't done before, diving off a diving board, which I hadn't done before. <laughs> so it was good to experience all these sports and actually feel what the athletes feel while at the same time competing in cross country in the NCAA. So it was a great experience, you know, for a young 17 year old leaving Northern Ireland going to the States was such a big adventure. But I maximized it to to my to my benefit and I found the studying very, very interesting, like uh, sports sociology and that and phys, kinesiology, biomechanics, all the real sort of core uh, subjects that you need to help you be a better strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I graduated uh, from Temple and headed home back to Ireland. And lo and behold, there wasn't too many jobs going, uh, not only in physical education, but definitely not in strength and conditioning back then. Uh, but I continued to uh, have that interest and got involved with some teams. And I got involved with the hurling team, where I'm from, in Fermanagh. Uh, and incorporated a lot of principles back then that I'd learned at Temple, not only in a study sense, but also from my training for track and cross country. Got the team very, very fit. And we won the All-Ireland, which is the national championship in year one. Unfortunately, then I had to leave the team and go over. I got a lecturing post in England. And I went to work in a place called Workington in Cumbria. And again, just by default, I ended up getting involved with the uh, local rugby league team. So I started taking them for training. The only problem there was I'd never played rugby before uh, yeah. because at the time of growing up in Northern Ireland, rugby wasn't played in my school because I went to a Catholic school. We played Gaelic football in Hurling. And rugby and cricket was considered British. So we didn't play it. So, mm -hmm. so here, here I was... Uh, I've been asked to train a rugby team and I had no clue of the sort of the energy systems that they use and the sort of training that, that they went through. So I said to the coach, look, I'd, I'd like to get involved, but would you mind if I play it a couple of games? Guy goes, yeah, no problem. We'd play for the third team. Now, at the time, I was very, very fit for running. I was very mm -hmm. running fit, but I certainly wasn't rugby fit. And I think in the first game, because of the contact and the collisions, I lasted about 15, 20 minutes. I had to come off. <laughs> and of course, it was wrong. I said, I'm absolutely busted. <laughs> but I stuck with it. Uh, and then I, I got involved heavily training the team. And that's when I really started to get the interest on how could I become a better SNC coach. And rugby league in England at the time was very open. Uh, I got to visit a lot of the big clubs, watch what they did, uh, what how they trained in the gym and on the pitch, how they made their condition very specific to the sport. And I continued to work on the Workington and we went up through the ranks and we had a bit of success. And uh, through my time in Workington, uh, uh, an ex uh, Great Britain tennis player, David Lloyd, he mm -hmm. brought up uh, two football teams and a rugby team in Hull. So he, he brought the, the, the teams up and he was going to put them in one stadium. He asked me would I come full time down the Hull. 
So I said, look, I'll do it for a year. I quit my uh, lecturing post and obviously quit Workington. Uh, at the same time, I got my ASCA accreditation, the Australian Strength and Condition Association Level 1. So I did I did have a, a professional qualification. Went down to Hull, worked with their football team and their rugby team at the same time, so double jobbing. So really, really interesting to work in professional football, but also uh, work in professional rugby league. Spent a few years there. Had a, you know, seen sort of both sides of the dichotomy. Uh, the whole rugby team was in the higher premiership echelons of the division, whereas the whole football team or the soccer team were at the bottom of Division Three. Mm-hmm. And just after watching uh, the Ted Lasso show, I don't know if people say it, but the American football coach come to coach an English team. And it was very similar. Like, we were really struggling. And if we had to finish at the bottom of that division, we would have uh, gone had to go part-time. So it was imperative that we got to stay up that year, then sustain ourselves, and then kick on. So with David's support, uh, I had full autonomy of all conditioning and strength of both the rugby and the football team. Rugby was great because they were used to it. Football, it was total alien. At that time, we're talking 99, 2000, fitness coaches and football, it just didn't happen. So I was pretty new in in that respect. But stayed with the both teams for a while, a couple of years, uh, built up a bank of experience, uh, still learning, going uh, to visit other clubs, this time more football clubs. Got to meet some good coaches. Now I moved on to Leeds, where I started working with the Leeds Rhinos Rugby League team and Leeds United football team. Again, great experience. Won a couple of trophies uh, with Leeds Rugby, and then I then moved on then to St Helens Rugby League, uh, which at the time was one of the, the, the top clubs in the world, and also did some work with Everton because they were close by. Uh, in my final year with St Helens Rugby League, we won the Challenge Cup, the Premiership, and we won the World Club Challenge. We we become world champions at club level, which was a great achievement. And through all that different uh, experiences, the head of the Irish national team uh, got in touch and asked me to come home to Ireland and be national fitness coach to the national rugby team. Uh, again, it was a leap of faith because I didn't know that much about rugby union. Uh, so I said to the coach, I, I need to do a bit of homework here and just maybe get to feel what some of that your players feel. And he said, that's fine. So got involved and then spent a very uh, interesting eight years working with the, uh, the Irish national team. And I'll maybe speak about this later, Tim. And part of the process of the success of that team was me getting suspended from my job from the national team for three or four months, which I'd like to talk about later because one of the pitfalls of being an SNC coach. So I spent eight years with Ireland. Uh, I then... Uh, Got offered a job in the Southern Hemisphere, but it didn't suit. Again, it was a rugby union job. So I took a job in Wales uh, with a rugby union team and at the same time started working with an Irish boxer whose goal was, be, was to be the Super Bantamweight World Champion. So within 14 months, we achieved our goal. Uh, the boxer called Bernard Dunn, he became world champion, beating a Cuban. So it was nice to work with an individual as well as a team sport. So I was doing team sports as well as individual with, with the boxer. I then uh, did some work in Gaelic football after that, uh, bringing in different structures and support systems for Gaelic football teams. Through all that, I got to work with the Irish national Gaelic football team who, who play their Australian counterparts in a combined series, which is very interesting. Uh, we ended up uh, at the time in 2011 getting the highest ever score, uh, victory m- margin against the Aussies. And then after that, then I then moved into Queens, where we are running an elite athlete program where athletes, if they reach international or elite level at their sport, that Queen's University will give them a type of American type scholarship where they get their SNC looked after, their psychology, their nutrition, their uh, accommodation, their uh, ac- academia, books, all that sort of stuff. And we're running that program now with 16 athletes. They're all at international elite level. And I also look after the academies at Queen's Academy teams, which involves football or soccer, rugby, men's and ladies, hockey, gymnastics. And uh, we did have a golfer and a vast array of sports. And that's where I'm at the month. You've, you've had quite a diverse career. You've moved around a lot. And, and one of the things I was writing on my notes is you said regularly, I took a job. And you make it sound so easy, Mike, where the jobs are just everywhere. 
and you can just pick and choose whichever one you want and here they come. But I suspect it wasn't like that. And how did you, how did you find your way into these different jobs across different sports, different levels that allowed you to continue building your resume? Uh, I suppose I was the right person in the right place at the right time. I mean, I suppose it, it all snowballed when David Lloyd had heard about the job I did with the Workington rugby team at the start. And him bringing me down to Hull was a was a massive step up the ladder. And then I suppose then the fact that I worked with two teams, rugby and football at the same time. I suppose my personality is I, I like to go out and meet people. So I built up my, my base of contacts within football and rugby. And th those sports allow you to do that. They're very open, most of them, in rugby, where they let you come in and watch you tr watch the team train, speak to the head coach, speak to the SNC coach, speak to the physio. And I suppose I made contacts. Uh, I think, too, when you start getting a couple of trophies on the shelf, mm -hmm. then that does help. You know, that yeah. does help. People do look to see what you did in the past. Have you had success? Uh, I think that's a big thing. The other big thing for, for me, Tim, is, I never expressed a no at all, okay? I never also crossed the lines of demarcation within my job. My job is to facilitate the head coach to present to him athletes who are fit for purpose, who can run hard for 80, 90 minutes, tackle hard, but also be resilient and not get injured. That's my job. I'm not a coach. I'm not a head coach. I'm not front of house. You know, I'm not a player. You know, my job is to do my job during the week, come match day, facilitate, and step out of the way and leave the coaches to do their job. So I think a big thing is know your place. Mm. The, the other thing that interested me a little bit was you mentioned some of these teams. And if, if you're um, in the U.S., you may not know some of these teams, but they're very successful teams. They're very successful, as you talked about, at the world championship level, uh, definitely at the club level, too. And then I was like, well, you know, Mike. Mike must have made it now, right? He's won the lottery being the SNC coach and uh, fat salaries all around. Is that the case in strength and conditioning in, in the UK? Uh, it depends what sport you go to. Okay. okay. There's two sort of different dichotomies. Rugby union, which there's only so many teams play at the high level at club. I have obviously did club, but also at the national level. That's well paid because the the owner of the club the coach of the club and all the staff of the club appreciate what an SNC coach can bring for to perform. Okay. And also about keeping players on the pitch. So you can you can make up to 85, 90, 120,000 pounds a year, which is a great salary. Yeah. On the other side, football, it's ridiculous. It the uh, SNC staff are undervalued, they're underpaid. Uh I once got an offer of a premiership club, got a phone call, would you be interested in coming over? I said, yeah, 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 went for a visit, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, I met the chief exec and he says, okay, we, we like what we see. We'd like to offer you the position. Uh, we'd like to pay you 650 an hour. And I thought, Jesus, 650 quid an hour? That's a good, he went, no, no. He said, six pound 50. And I looked him in the face, I said, mate, I pay my babysitter more than that. Yeah. You know? But these clubs know that if, if, if you don't take it, tomorrow there'll be 10,000 kids will take it. And that they'll work for five thousand pound a year or do it for free because they want to be in there. Okay. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. The only problem with that is because I've done some consultancy work with Manchester City. I'm big, big mates with fitness coach who was at Manchester United when Alex Ferguson was in charge and now the current fitness coach. They're good guys. But if you bring in somebody who's not strong, you know, it, it, it dilutes our, our industry, our profession, and players will walk all over you. So in mm -hmm. football, you have to be mentally very strong. You've got to stick to the philosophies and you've got to fight your corner without stepping over the line. Because if you step over the line in football and if you annoy a player, you're gone the next day. So you, you've got to know how to handle yourself. You know, football can be toxic. It, it can be toxic in the dressing room. It can be toxic in, in the gym. And you have to know how to conduct yourself. But that comes with experience. OK, and in there as an 18, 19 year old doing an internship, sometimes you can get trampled on. So you have to be strong. You know. Well, let's go back to the rugby, and you mentioned getting suspended. So I'm curious how that happened and, and what the result of that was, because it, it clearly didn't ruin your career. No, that, that happened in 2003. We, we'd gone to the World Cup, 
And uh, I'd only been in, in the job about a year, year and a half. And I'd come into a national setup where the players really weren't fit for purpose. You know, they weren't able to play 80 minutes high octane rugby. They were breaking down with injury. They had too much body fat. You know, they didn't know the importance of sleep, of nutrition, of taking rest days. They didn't even know the, the importance of eating properly pre-game, post-game. And I cut a long story short, we went to the World Cup. We got the quarterfinal. It just wasn't good enough. But they were doing that on a three-week pre-season. Okay. Now I had been involved in rugby league for a number of years. So in rugby league, we we're working off a, a nine, 10, 12 week preseason. So I, I fought tooth and nail uh, to try and get this preseason, but I did it and I did an interview with a, with a journalist. And I was totally, I was totally honest with it. I said, look, unless we get this big block of preseason, we're going nowhere as a, as a rugby nation. He printed the story. The powers that be didn't like it and they suspended me, you know, what they didn't realize was I'd agreed for your contract verbally with the treasurer of the union before I'd done the interview, which is legally binding. But more importantly than that, Tim, was the player stuck up for me. And the player said, if you don't reinstate him, then there's a good chance we might go on strike. So once you have that buy-in and that back-in, you're okay. So that, that led us then to get in our pre-season. And then we ended up then producing the most successful Irish rugby team in history. And that's still the case. Okay, mm -hmm. so... But maybe I went about it the wrong way. I was a bit younger, you know, a bit more testosterone driven. But I, I, you know, I wanted to fight for the players. I wanted them to go to war prepared because in my eyes, they're going to have to do battle and they weren't fully prepared. You know, they were going to the gun fight with a knife. Our other teams were going to the guns with Uzis and AK-47s and we were getting blown away, you know. Yeah, it's an interesting example of, of sticking to your principles and sticking to what you believe and you know, asking for what you need in order for you to be successful. Because it, it's easy, it would be easy for you to just keep your mouth shut, not say anything, let things continue as is, knowing that you, you're not as good as you could be. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit like losing. And I, I do this analogy. I hate losing. I, I can't stand losing. But if I know we've done everything possible, every single 1% that we've done and we lose, I can take it. Mm. But if we lose in an event and we haven't covered every single base and took every 1% that we could, then it kills me. The caveat with me getting suspended was so when I was reinstated, my card was marked by the union, not the players, but the coach. And the coach said to me, look, he says, as long as I'm in position, you're safe. He says, the minute I go, you're a dead man walking. And he left in 2008, and the day after he uh, had been sacked, I got called in to get sacked. But I'd already teed up a job anyway, a better job, so it wasn't too bad, you know. So it was important. Well, transition, if you will, to to what you do at Queens. You you talked about you you know providing strength and conditioning for a variety of different athletes, all at an elite level, and, and it's a unique situation where these athletes, at least in the UK, get scholarships. I mean, in the US. That is pretty common, but in the UK, less so. How do you tailor strength and conditioning to so many different um, different sports, you know, male, female, team sport, individual sport, power sport, endurance sport? How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm massive in the, in the individualization of my programs. So what I tend to do is is I profile my athlete, first of all, meet them for a coffee and a, and a flapjack, have a chat. What do you like? What do you not like? What are you good at? What... What injuries have you had? I just build a bit of a profile, okay? Then we say, okay, well, where do we want, where do we want to go to in all this? What's our end point? And we figure out our end point, and then I fill in the parts in the middle. So I look at what they do on the pitch. So if it's hockey, then obviously there's a lot of rotation. So I build in rotational type exercises, number one, to help improve performance, but more importantly, number two, prevent injury. Because a lot of our hockey players might just pass right to left. There's never any left to right passing, so we have to fix that on balance. If they're a rower, okay, we look at what 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 do they row? Are they a long distance rower? Are they sprinter rowers? Are they heavyweight? Are they lightweight? How long are they in the boat for? Okay, how long does their event last for? What's the duration? And then we apply the basic principles of S and C to a rowing. If it's Gaelic football, then we do it. Obviously, they're not they don't need as much strength and power. It's more strength and endurance. So we we build a, a strength and endurance program based on their position because my corner forwards in football should train different to my midfielders, to train different to my cornerbacks, should train different to my goalkeepers. They're all got different needs on the pitch. Okay, how do how do I discover that? I go watch them play. I go with a flask of tea or coffee, a wee muffin. I sit in the stand and I watch them and say, hmm, how does he move? Well, that's how he moves. What does he do most of in the game? Okay. It's a bit like with my boxer. 
when I started working with a boxer, before we did any training, I went and watched them fight, and then I got in the ring with them, and I discovered in super bantamweight, they don't actually throw that many punches, but they do a lot of moving and wrestling, move and wrestle, and then hit, 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 hit. So he is fatiguing from the wrestling, not from getting hit. So we increased his punch power, but he also did a lot of contact and a lot of wrestling as well. So, and, and, but for me, the best way to learn is go in and do it if you can, okay? Not at a high level and be able to do it. And then you have to be able to back that up in the gym. I mean, I always say, do not ask an athlete to do something that they can't do themselves. So if you say, I want to do a hand clean from, from the midday, and they say, well, show me, be able to do it. If they say do a deep front squat, it doesn't have to be 200 kilograms of a deep front squat, but it has to be sort of technically competent, okay? Will that last forever? No, I'm getting old. I'm mm -hmm. starting to go. But have some sort of level of competency that you can show them if they ask you, you know? And, and then that's how I, I sort of individualize my programs. You, know? you, you talked about maybe aging a little bit. And uh, one of the challenges I think that all of us have as we age is, is the generation gap increases where the, the people that you're working with are younger and younger and younger compared to you. And so finding that relationship or keeping up to date with research where things are changing, but you're not, you're not in school anymore. How do you stay current and how do you keep that relationship open with your athletes so that you can relate to them and provide them with the most current knowledge as opposed to, well, back when I was in university, I learned this. Brilliant question. Well, obviously, I always try and back up a lot of my practical application with science. So I, I read a lot of journals. I read a lot of stuff. I read a lot of start and strength. Uh, I've had the good the good uh, fortune to present with Ron McKeefrey over in Poland. So I, I know how how advanced some of the American SNC training is. So I read a lot of American SNC journals. Uh, but at the same time, Tim, a squat is a squat is a squat. A deadlift is a deadlift. It was 20 years ago, and it is still in 2021. I have a preferential bias. I love Olympic lifting, okay, because I know it gives me so much more performance-related qualities. So if it's appropriate, I'll try and get most of my athletes Olympic lifting in three or four months correctly with the mm -hmm. correct technique. If not a full clean, it'll be some derivative, some type of snatch. But I'm always learning. I brought, I bring out DVD. I brought out a DVD on Olympic lifting because I had a real issue with people doing Olympic lifting wrong, and also incorporating Olympic lifting in circuit type training, which is not, it's not appropriate. It's not correct. Hence, a high plaza of injuries. So I try to back up what I say. It's more do as I do rather than do as I say. You know, but I'm always reading uh, current journals. I'm always reading scientific reviews. I'm a member of the Australian Strength and Distance Association, so I do a lot of peer reviews uh, for their members before th their journals get published. And also I write myself. I, I write myself a lot as well, and, and I contribute to articles so that way. So we're always learning this game. We're never going to know it all. We never will do, but we strive to do our best. You know, mm. With the relationship with the athletes, uh, it works quite well for me because I have three young children. And I always say to myself now since the kids came along, would I do this with my kid? And if I wouldn't do this with my kid, then don't do it with my athletes because they're somebody's child. They're coming in, they might be 21, 22, but they're still somebody's child. And as strength and conditioning coaches, we have a duty of care. What we prescribe and present in the gym has to be safe. And I look at this risk and reward, okay? What will this lift give me as a reward? What is, what's the risk involved? If the risk is too high, we don't do it, we do something else. And that's how I connect because I don't think we should get injured in the gym. There's no, there's no reason we should get injured for the gym. If our program is progressive, safe, there's enough recovery, and it, it's periodized in the right way. There's there's a definite risk for some athletes for overtraining, where you know, they're taught maybe from their parents up that more is better. If you're not training all the time, then somebody else is getting ahead of you and staying ahead of you, and what are you going to do to catch up? And, and we see professional athletes follow this too and, and often end up, uh, getting injured because of this overtraining. Do you have situations or, or athletes like that? And if so, how do you how do you educate them that sometimes less is more? Well, another great question, and you're absolutely right. The higher the level of the athlete, I find, the more the propensity to overtrain because that's where they're elite athletes. They want to train and they'll do whatever it takes. 
for me, it's very much sitting down and talking about the super compensation graph. I make it very simple. And I say, guys, you do not develop when you're in the gym and you do not develop when you're on the pitch. It's about eating and sleeping. The minute you step out of the gym and the minute you step off the pitch, that's when you start your developing if you get the correct nutrition and the correct recovery and the correct hydration. So that rest and recovery, eat and sleep. And I just show them a simple graph of when is the timed period of when they recover. When they're off their feet, they've left the gym, they've eaten, they've hydrated and recovering. That's when we develop. And I show them then on the graph how overtraining will lead to injury and stainless. But it's very simple. It's just that super compensation graph where our too much training puts us below the baseline and we end up getting injured. And it seems to work. Yeah, and, and I've seen athletes who, who don't understand the concept of rest and having an off season because if I'm resting, I'm doing something wrong. I should be doing something because that's what I'm always doing. And that's a big challenge. And, and I don't know about you, but I've used the term active recovery as yeah. a, hey, we're building this into your training program rather than just saying, take a break. Yeah, I think if you have an athlete that will not take time off their feet, then we disguise the recovery. So we do. And I'll have athletes come in to me and I know they've been on the water maybe that morning. And sometimes they'll do some crazy stuff. Like they'll do like 1,500 repeats. They'll do 20, 1,500 repeats on, on the org. And they'll come to me at 6 o'clock. And I'll say, what do you do today? Brilliant. And whatever plan I had them today, I just screw it up. Don't let them see it. I said, Mom, we'll do a bit of foam rolling. Here, do you want a cup of tea? Let's go get a cup of tea. Let's do a bit more foam rolling. Oh, Christ, that's time up. See mm -hmm. you tomorrow. Mm. And they, they think because I foam roll, I had a cup of tea and a chat. That ticks the box for them mentally and physically. We're trying to disguise that some type of recovery, mm. you know. But it's hard because they all want to train. They're all driven. They don't want to show any sign of weakness. But it's an education process, you know. You've trained a variety of different athletes at, at all kinds of levels, professionally, and now here you're you're working with elite level as well. When you think back on your career and what you've learned along the way from a strength and conditioning coach position, what advice would you have from somebody who maybe wants to get into SNC or maybe wants to, to improve their situation? Right, great question again, because at the moment, strength and conditioning is just saturated position mm -hmm. all over the world and there's only so many positions. So what defines you from anybody else? Well, I always want to present and say, what makes a good SNC coach? Well. You need your degrees and your master's degrees and PhDs. That's all great to have done the pet knowledge. But the biggest thing that will define you is your personality. Number one, can you deliver what you're trying to deliver? Can you connect with your athletes? Because if they don't connect with you, you won't get that buy-in. If you don't get that buy-in, then they're not going to do what you want to do. Number three, do you have the courage of your, your convictions that you stick to your philosophy? And I see that a lot in football. When you sit down and do your preseason program, if it was right in June when you planned it, it's probably still right in October when the team's lost six in a row and everybody's screaming, not fit enough, not, not fit enough. You know, I always give the, uh, the the sort of thing where a team could win 6 0 on Saturday and they come off the pitch, Christ, that team's flying, they're going great. They lose 2 1 the following Friday, they're not fit enough. Now, you don't lose that much fitness in five days, but, you know, fitness can be totally overanalyzed, but as an SNC coach, Learn how to deliver. Learn how to connect. Know your subject matter. Okay, it's very, very important. But don't do 15 years of study with no application, no apply, because then you're too far off the ball. Go and coach kids, okay? Offer up your time and coach kids, because if you can coach kids, you can coach anybody. That, that's where it's at, okay? If you can organize kids, okay, plan your sessions. And a big important point for me is always have an outcome. What was the outcome of that gym session? What was the outcome of that conditioning session on the pitch? Was it specific to the sport? Was it specific to the position the player plays in? And at the end of the day, have you achieved your outcome? Because if you haven't achieved your outcome, you've just spent 45 minutes of your life that you're never getting back. You've missed one unit of training that could be the difference to winning an Olympic gold or not, and you've lost that. So make sure the outcome's been met. Mm. Yeah, Great points and, and great advice. And, and one of the things we were talking about just before the show is, I think to summarize, a lot of strength and conditioning coaches know how to create programs, know how to deliver programs, but they don't necessarily know how to coach, which is the, the working with the individual. 
well, that's what that that's our title: strengthening and discipline coach. Can you coach? And that is a skill. Okay, some people don't coach; they babysit or they fill time. And what I mean by that is, just because you have a, a forty-five minute conditioning session on the pitch, and there's twenty-seven million yellow cones and forty-two million red cones, ladders and poles, and your athletes are running through the poles and running through the ladders and they're looking good, but what's the outcome? What are you trying to achieve? Is it a speed session? Is there a proper recovery in that speed session? Is it an energy system development session? Well, if it is, what energy system are you trying to develop? Is it is it lactate CP? Is it aerobic? Is it anaerobic? Okay. So be very specific and know what you're trying to achieve in that session. Hmm. Great advice. Uh, Mike McGurn, if somebody has a question for you, wasn't able to get it to you in, in this, but maybe later on our podcast or whatever, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? If somebody wants to flip me an email at uh, mike at mcgurneliteSport.com at the bottom there, I'll do my best to try and give them the correct answer. And if I can't find it, I have a, a bank of great conditioning coaches who I can call upon. Ron McKeefrey from the great US, Dan Baker down in Australia, Mick Clegg at Manchester United. I'm sure they could help me out with some of the questions if need be. So for those of you listening to the podcast, it's mike at McGurn, M-C-G-U-R-N, EliteSport.com. Correct. Well, Mike, just want to say thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your wisdom and, and time with us. And uh, of course, those of you who are watching, just a reminder, each and every week, we have an interview with a special guest. Hope you join us next week. But on behalf of myself, Tim Baggerst and Mike McGurn, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for having me. Thank you.